Got it. All right, Brooke, all yours. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Pat Conroy Center's virtual open mic, um, also in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association. Um, Terry McLeod is our featured writer and reader this evening. Um, but we also have some great writers here with us that are going to read some tonight. So we're going to get started. Um, I have for our first three in the lineup, I have Susan, Jackie, and Barry. Susan McCartney. Sorry, well, we got two Susans, so I have to be clear on that. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yes. Yeah. This is a departure from my usual fare. For you who are used to my usual fare. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, a timely topic called Virgin's Rule. January 1964. The bar in the basement of the 88 cent store is a dump. It would be freezing now except for the boiler in the back room. Stacked crates are used as a bar. The smooth plank on top makes it real. Freddie Better stands in a cloud of smoke at the far end, his usual place on Friday night. Freddie isn't what you'd call good looking. Red hair, acne scars, red skin, watery blue eyes. He tips his glass. One more time, cowboy. Cowboy Dash flips Freddie's glass with the precision of a professional barman, pulls the tap slides a glass to Freddie. Cowboy owns the bar. His agreement with local law makes his bar the most popular college hangout in Missoula. Raids are on slow nights, no arrests made. Justine and Sarah are lucky to get a table. Soon half the campus will clatter down the fire escape into the bar to celebrate the beginning of winter quarter. Sarah's eyes tear up from smoke. Freddie leans in front of the table. Justine nudges Sarah. Me, Sarah says. Yeah, you, Freddie laughs. Want to go to a party? Maybe. What a goofy laugh. Tomorrow night around nine, pick you up at the dorm. He laughs again, disappears in smoke. The heavy bar door bangs. A swarm pushes in. Justine stands up, let's get out of here. Sarah follows her, searches the room. He really disappeared. They trudge toward campus. Justine drags off her cigarette. You know who that was? Some redhead with too much confidence. Honey, that was Freddie Betters, big man on campus. How does he know me? You've been here a whole week. Everybody knows everything about you by now. Her laughter whoops down the cold pavement. Sarah smiles. What luck to pair up with Justine Thomas. Justine is from New York City, a distant blur to girls like Sarah bred in outback Montana. Her roommate left school to get married, so Sarah got the bed. She has to get married, Justine explained. She's pregnant. Sarah was shocked. Nobody says pregnant before a wedding. The word pregnant is only whispered after white veiled brides walk the aisle trumpeting virginity. Wedding guests count to nine. Family claims birth premature. Mm -hmm. Sunday morning, Sarah sits in thin sunshine on the wide steps of Herod Hall. The freshman girl's dorm has protected virginity for decades with imposing house mothers and curfews. Icicles melt from its peak roof flash down, surround the building with a shallow, muddy moat. Sarah stares at the Rossi training field across the street. Justine, you think Freddie's mad at me? Justine props against a granite column of the porch. Freckled face tilts toward the sun. She scoots further back against Groove Brooks. Bricks. Well, he got here at exactly to nine o'clock. I gave him your message that you couldn't make it. What'd he say? He laughed, goofy, backpedaled out, drove off. He borrowed a car. You think he's mad? 
hard to say, you stood him up. I forgot I'd made another date. Justine's eyes slant down. With whom? Oh, just a guy from town. There breathed a tiny laugh. Not a college guy? Justine asks frostily, a townie? Sarah pulls her old plaid coat tighter. Probably won't see him again. Even she knows townies are out of the question for regal college misses. Justine <laughs> swings long legs off the porch. I need coffee. They link arms across the slushy training field. I step puddle. You're too much, Sari. <laughs> I'm out of Africa. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah, from Africa to the campus. <laughs> you have a great sense of place in your stories, Susan. Great sense of place. Thank you. Oh, I loved it. Takes you back, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Yeah, not the ethic of today's campuses. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jackie, you're next if you're ready. Okay, I guess I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this will be a departure from Susan, not a departure from my usual, but, uh, you know, we do feel cold. We don't have winters so uh, brutal as some of our northern uh, friends and family, but it feels cold when it turns. So I decided to read three winter poems. And the first one, well, it could be winter or, yeah, about now. It's called Unsheltered Garden. And it has an epigraph by HD from her poem, Sheltered Garden, in which she laments a very manicured type garden. Oh, to blot out this garden, to forget, to find a new beauty in some terrible wind tortured place. HD, sheltered garden. Mm -hmm. I push into the slash of winter uphill, far from the house, blast of onion air, swirls ochre leaves through garden rows like scattering mice. Wind raptured vines rattle, flail earth, escaping plot to wood where craggy branches lie. Exposed to sun and rain, melons ripen among broken limbs, split, drop seeds, sheathed, survival strong till time's slow germination neatly mingles tree and vine till I climb over downed trees, each thick skin fruit I find a prize in my palm. Please. Thank you can relate to that, Barb. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get your, your late um, uh, squash and pumpkins. This next poem is called Winter Birds. No sunrise, though I look east over brown furrowed earth, roosters sound continuous alarms and cars come and go more frequently like labor pains, heavy silences between. No sunlight, the old barn stands black the yard stretches as a desert plain. Dark pecan branches scratch the pallor of the sky. A red speck burns through like wizardry. A cardinal swoops, lights, transforms the scene. Gold finches, clumps of grass, animated clusters of topaz berries and golden tips of weeds appear against the curtain of the sky. I remember before the end of Michigan winter, my mother pointed childlike to the bright bird searching food under snow. Very nice. Thank no you. Bird. 
Thank you. Beautiful image. This next poem also kind of harkens back to um, a childhood in the in the cold climb, but from our uh, vantage point with camellias. The title is Camellias in December. My back to the wind, I pick camellias. I study the old bushes, thick trunk, engraved with aqua, silver lichens, Spanish moss, lake work, like frosted window panes on icy northern nights. When after bedtime, I would steal downstairs to catch the light from a solitary street lamp that sprinkled through the frost into my hands. Ooh, mm. great image. Nice. That's really beautiful. Nice. Very nice. Thank you, Joel. Oh. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. So we can look forward to a, a short. Thank Those you. are beautiful. Also, you look beautiful in the black and red. I love it. Thanks, Brooke. The snow. The snow. I forget about snow, you know, sometimes. <laughs> Happily. <laughs> right. I'll stop and do some. <laughs> no, I was born in Montana, you know, so I. Grew up waiting through snow. Ooh. Nice not to be there. Ooh. Barry is next. Aha. Uh -huh. If he's, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I've decided to make this my annual December reading. It's my one Christmas story. A reprise for some of you is from a collection of micro memoirs uh, that I had a manuscript floating around out there. Uh, it's, uh, I was told that getting memoir published if you're not famous is an extra challenge, thus the title Barry Who? 33 <laughs> Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. They all have a date. And this one is similar to the one that Susan just read. December 21st, 1964. <laughs> it's called The Freudian Slip of Freudian Slips. We were big shots. College freshmen home for their first Christmas break. The girls, they loved us. We carried tales of adventure, mostly made up, from Penn State and Yale and Temple and Pitt, even far off exotic places like Michigan. I was especially delighted to see Linda Rose, a high school senior in this Northern Pennsylvania town, pay a lot of attention to me. We'd always hung out in the same crowd. She was very friendly, even I thought slightly interested, but I never had the nerve to pursue that. I only knew Linda Rose was gorgeous, astonishing red hair, Paul Newman level blue eyes, a far, and I mean far better figure than Paul Newman could ever have. And what I considered the highlight, or should I say highlights of Linda Rose, the most beautiful dimples in North America. When she smiled, oh my God. So, Wait a minute, am I missing a page? Oh, so she asked, I think I am missing a page. Is that what you said? <laughs> well, I'll just pick it up there. So she asked, I would, there's a part where, oh yes, here it is, I'm sorry. We were all loitering at the community center one day when Linda approached. I said hello to those dimples, then, <clears throat> Quite the surprise. So, she asked, how would you like to come over to the house for dinner one night? Had I been able to speak, I would have immediately said yes. Instead, I stumbled through me, house, your house? Yes, my house. The house where you live? Yes, Barry, I do live in my house. 
<laughs> Finally, I recovered enough to reply. I would absolutely love to. This was a house worthy in every detail, chandeliers downward of Dr. Rose, her dermatologist, real estate mogul, big deal in the community father. I was careful to introduce myself very properly to the entire family. How do you do? Very nice to meet you. What a lovely house you have. I presented her mother with a box of the most expensive custard filled chocolate desserts I could find. Thank you, you shouldn't have. Oh no ma'am, really, it's my pleasure. When I shook her father's hands, hand, I could feel scrutiny. At the table, he really started in. So what are you studying, young man? Have you decided on a major yet? I don't believe I know your parents. What does your father do? Why did you choose Temple? Did you apply to Penn? That's where I went to med school, you know, Penn. Do you plan on staying in the area after graduation? I swore any minute the guy would say, so what are your intentions regarding my daughter? There was a lot of please pass this and please pass that. Thank you. Oh, this is so delicious, etc." Then about halfway through the entree, someone, probably not her father, said something slightly amusing. I glanced toward Linda to catch her smile. And yes, there they were, those dimples. I turned to her mother. Mrs. Rose, I said, your daughter has the most amazing nipples. <laughs> Who would have thought the most painful part of college would turn out to be Christmas break. <laughs> I love that story. That's great. Barry, what were you, you trying to say exactly? It just never gets old, Barry. No, we don't yeah, like to that story. A great story. What were you trying to say? Dimples. Dimples. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. It happens. <laughs> uh. Of course you were. <laughs> and you were thinking oh. nipples too. <laughs> yes, we know where Barry's head was at. <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Thank you. All right, we have up next, which I meant to say earlier, let you get heads up, but I always forget to do that. I have Jane, Barb, are you reading? Yes. Okay, yes. So Jane, Jane, Barb, and then I have Susan Madison. I think she's disappeared. Yeah, she, she got a phone call she had to get to. Oh, okay, well then we have Annie. Okay, okay. All right, um, my story is, an excerpt from the latest chapter in um, my Boston novel in short stories. And this chapter is called, or short story is called, <clears throat> excuse me, Angela in Autumn. And Angela is the wife of the protagonist, the main protagonist in the book, Jimmy, who um, is the toll collector and um, world-class drunk. And she's married to him. And they're young, they're, oh, you know, they're, they're quite young. They're in their late twenties. Anyway, she's headed to work on the T. She was waiting for Jimmy on the station platform to tell him some news and then just looked at her watch and said she couldn't, couldn't wait any longer. Had a, a terrible situation with a man who was bothering her there and barely made it to her train. And she's, she's rattling into the station uh, over at her job where she's a waitress in the North End. So we pick her up there. Uh, she reached beneath her apron, clasping both hands there, and savored a moment alone while the train clattered and swayed its way to the North End. Just really wanted to tell your father I'm pregnant with you, she confided to the bump shielded by her purse just in case he'd care enough to come home once in a while. The train ride over the channel was not a long one. As the tea rattled into the elevated North Station, she looked across North Washington Street at the coach lit 
burgundy awning of Joe Tetchy's restaurant. Wouldn't it be great to have a job there? Angela knew she was lucky to have the one she had. She'd never have gotten it unless Poppy's brother had spoken for her. And for all her aching legs, back and feet, she was still grateful to work at the place. The tips were good, and she'd even seen Tony Canigliaro there one night after a double header at Fenway. Who else could say that? She left the tea station and trudged across the macadam, lingering on the sidewalk for a final moment before turning down the side street to the pizzeria. Throwing back her head, she took in the aromas of the North End. Regina's pizza was the first to reach her nose. It always was because their oven started early and went all night. Doors flung wide to the neighborhood to accommodate the never ending lines of customers. Tonight, <clears throat> that whiff was followed by a hint of garlic and beef brujol wafting from Joe Tetchy's kitchen exhaust. The fall breeze carried the fragrant, fragrant aroma of the last Italian cheesecake pulled from the ovens over at Anthony's Bakery before they closed for the night. The smoky scent of roasted chestnuts from the vendor's cart at the corner reached her next. She glanced in that direction and watched groups of three and four starting to stream toward Boston Garden. Must be a Celtics game tonight, she thought. The evocative chords of a concertina reached her ears. Without seeing him, she knew there was an old man sitting on a fire escape somewhere nearby, playing the songs of his boyhood and a homeland he'd never see again. She thought how easily she could live her entire life here in this one mile square and never grow tired of the sights, the sounds, the smells. A horrible wave of homesickness overcame her. Angela shook it off, arranged a smile on her face, and turned towards Thatcher Street. The crowds were already past the intersection. No one tips a sourpuss, she thought, and I'll be needing all sorts of baby things before long. As she forced her way through the crowd, she repeated, coming through, coming through. You want your pizza tonight? Better let me through here. At the door, she saw the owner's wife eyeing her and looking at the clock. Katarina looked as though central casting had plucked her from behind a brick oven. So perfect was she in her role. Her girth, wrapped in an apron smattered with semolina flour and tomato puree, advertised her love of pizza. Her salt and pepper hair was caught up in a knot atop her head, dusted with more flour. The only thing her appearance lacked this evening was a rolling pin in her fleshy hands. I know I'm late, Katerina, she said breathlessly. Do I get back tables? Before Katerina could answer, she heard a whoop behind her. Ange, where you been? Thought you might be working tonight. Santa Maria, Vinnie Scalzo from high school. Why tonight? Sorry, Vinnie, you had your chance. Angela swung around and retorted, narrowing her eyes. She planted herself just under his face and rebuttoned her blouse to her throat, pulling a gold crucifix in front of the collar with exaggerated hand movements. I'm taken now. Gone all Virgin Mary now, have we, since we married that Mick? Too good for us over here now? The friends he'd come in with surrounded them. She lowered her voice, Vinny, don't do this, not here. Her eyes pleaded with him. The change in Angela whetted his appetite and he pressed his advantage, turning to his buddies to mimic her. Oh, Vinny, don't do me like that, she says. They snickered. All four of them began to taunt her with her own words. Katerina bustled over, moving behind them. Look, guys, we're too busy for this foolishness. Get pizza or get out. We'll order, Katerina, but we want Ange to serve us. Sorry, no can do. Her station's full already. Be good boys and try the takeout line tonight. Angela looked at Katerina with relief and fresh respect. Nah, I don't think so, Vinny sneered. Katerina lowered her gravelly voice to a dangerous growl. 
you misunderstood. That wasn't a suggestion voice. She reached up, gripped Vinny's collar with her left hand and the back of his belt with her right and ran him to the door so fast he couldn't recover his balance. Excuse me, excuse me, she ordered the customers in her way. Trash coming out. Vinny's friends stopped laughing and followed. When they reached the sidewalk, Katarina gave him a final push and released him. You're banned, Vincent, and your mama will know about this tomorrow. She turned to include his friends and, list and hissed. You all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. This is not how we treat a woman in this neighborhood. Eat somebody else's pizza. You're no longer welcome at Regina. The crowd outside applauded. Angela was already busy taking orders and running pitchers of Coke and beer to her tables when Katarina returned and hovered behind her. Angela mouthed a silent at her boss as she turned and moved to another table. Katarina followed her and leaned in, rasping, Angela, you got about six more months doing this tops. Your apron's getting pretty tight. Think about it. She turned and cut a swath through the crowd to the front of the pizzeria, keeping one eye on the cashier, the other on her husband, and her third eye, it was said, on the rest of the neighborhood. Well, she doesn't miss much, thought Angela. How come Jimmy hasn't even noticed? The answer was too much to think about right now. She pulled a pencil from the back of her twist, withdrew a green lined order pad from her apron, sucked in her stomach and smiled at a table full of suddenly polite college kids. What kind of pie are we thinking about tonight, guys? She leaned over the boy on the end to collect the menus. He suddenly jumped up, nearly upending the chrome edge table. What was that, he yelped. You have a mouse in your pocket? Something just smacked my arm. Not from around here, she joked. Are you, she joked. That's just my huge tips jumping around from all the excitement. The guys exploded in laughter. Angela collected their orders and headed to the kitchen, happy she'd recovered quickly enough to deflect further attention. She leaned against the wall by the ovens out of the crowd's view for a moment, pressing her forehead into the plaster. Oh dear God in heaven, my baby's first kick. I really do have to start thinking about what comes next. That's Angela's dilemma for the evening. <laughs> oh, she's a poor girl. Yeah, she's in a mess. Yeah, what what is Jane. the title of that, Jane? The book? Yeah. The, um, it comes from a Babe Ruth quote. Um, Every strike brings you closer to the next home run and to the next home run is the name of the book. Right now, that's the working oh. title, yeah. I was struck oh. by the phrase, get pizza or get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love going to Boston with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably all different. Probably none of those places are there anymore. <laughs> this is all back in 1970, 70, 80, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. Okay. Probably a lot different. Thank you, Jane. Always a pleasure. Um, this is going to be three minutes of a short story called Sunny Friday. The 553 train from Copenhagen arrived, and the community center was already buzzing with locals for Solri Friday or Sunny Friday. Towns along the coast of Zealand take turns hosting the event on Friday during the short summers, allowing young adults to meet up before clubbing in Copenhagen all night. Christian expected, hoped really, for Jillian to be on the train along with most everyone who hadn't arrived yet. She made a lasting impression on him in the towns of Gintofte and Vilbeck, yet he hadn't introduced himself. Like a butterfly, she flitted about and then gone. She traveled alone, and had a Danish vibe, but her actions said she wasn't native. Tonight, Christian volunteered as welcomer for his hometown of Hersholm. Why? Because he was an endearing first impression 
and he wasn't letting another evening pass without introducing himself to Jillian. In a faded lavender shirt, mustard colored jeans, and tan suede chukkas, Christian raised his glass. Welcome to Ao. Welcome everyone. More glasses rose in the air and this sunny Friday was officially on. Christian then craned his neck towards the parking lot and saw no one. Dennis, his best friend, knew Christian was keeping his eyes out for a particular someone. So he kept an eye out for his friend. Hey Christian, I think you left a guest in the garden as he pointed to the window with a Carlsberg in his hand. It looks like she may have dropped something. He walked outside and watched butterflies flitter around her as if she were the source of nectar. She extended her arms and opened her hands to entice them to land. And when one did, Christian felt a jolt inside his chest that rocked him back ever so slightly. Whoa, she really is like a butterfly. If he stood still with his arms open, maybe she'd flitter around him. It's working, he thought, as she walked towards him. Welcome to her song, Taylor Dudansk. Christian looked into her brown eyes for any recognition of Danish. Lilt, lifting her right hand with her thumb and index finger almost touching. Taylor du Engelsk, Jillian asked knowing most Danes were quite fluent in English as adults. Can I get you anything? A Carlsberg, a butterfly net, some nectar? Do you have any butterfly milkweed? Ah, yes, around the corner with the rest of the butterfly garden. Oh, have I met a lepidopterist? A what? I haven't mastered all the multisyllabic English words yet. I'm sorry, I was trying to be funny. You mastered that one though. I'm Jillian, just got off the train. Christian extended his hand and I'm Christian. What brings you to Denmark? Oh, can't wait to hear the rest of that. <laughs> we'll do it three minutes at a time. <laughs> I love that butterfly imagery. Oh, I love it. Uh, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> oh, how does Jackie do that? I want to put one of those. Up I know. There. I just saw the heart pop up, and I was like, "How did that happen?" You got a, you got a reactions, reactions on your. Oh, how do you do that? Oh, there's another heart. Click on reactions, and then you can react. Oh, okay. All right. I don't have any hearts anywhere. <laughs> I don't even know how to do that. Me either. <laughs> I'm such a techie. Just follow me. I'll show you the way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, another wonderful sense of place. We've been doing good geography and, and time travel tonight. <laughs> Under our lust. <laughs> Well, we have Annie now, if she's ready to read. Hello. This is my Hi. first time here, and I, I'm just declaring myself a writer recently because I closed down, well, not closed down. I, I left my book club so I could write. Um, closed <laughs> I didn't close. I, there's a new administrator there. No, I just found funny. <laughs> So I'm going to read one. Uh, it's, it's about my health um, and a dream sequence. Uh, it's not too long. Okay. Your respiratory and throat muscles have been, have been becoming too weak to sustain you for much longer because they're going to get weaker with each day that passes, said Dr. Gutzblatt. All I could say was, okay, thank you. I knew what was happening to my body. I could feel it. He, do, he did not need to tell me. People couldn't see it, but I was shutting down. Are you sure you understand what I'm telling you, said Dr. G? Yes, I'll be fine. I understand. I understand all you've been telling me. Okay, Annie, I'm going to call you tomorrow to make sure we're on the same page. Because I don't think you understand. 
So I walk out of Dr. G's office, pushing my walker, lifting each leg. They are so very heavy right now. I'm moving slower than normal towards my permanent slumber. I could just sense that I was not gonna wake up from a sleep sometime soon. Again, he didn't have to tell me, but now that he told me, it seems so much sooner. I remember getting home and laying down on the couch and snuggling with my pup, Sullivan, and falling fast asleep. I think I might have been dreaming before my eyes closed. So once they were closed, I was in a deep sleep, which is typical for someone like me because I have hypersomnia. This is what I remember of the dream. With each step I was taking, I started to float up and up higher into the sky. A thousand pounds of dead weight I was carrying, like luggage I could never unpack, was falling off of me to the ground. When everything holding me down was gone, I realized I was sitting on a dandelion seed floating in the wind that a child had just wished upon. Only I believe this time, this was my wish that was going to become true. I sat on that little dead seed from a yellow flower that most people only consider a weed with pride. I saw its beauty in life because it, was actually, it actually fed people and made beautiful bouquets children would randomly go and pick for their mother to say I love you or on Mother's Day. Then in death, there were others just like me who blew wishes on the dandelions, pillow of soft white, individually packed lacy wishes it had transformed into. They became an ocean of what so many of us need, a magical gift of hope. I see my life very similarly. Let me explain. It was so comfortable to be there. I felt I was right where I needed to be. I was becoming one with the breeze and the sky and the sunshine. I was able to sway from one side to the other so easily as we crossed town visiting each of my friends and even some of my no longer friends. Why would I visit my no longer friends? You see, they are the ones that decided to stop loving me because I was sick or because my attitude wasn't perfect for them while I was sick. I, I left for each of them a whisper of love and solace that I am finally free to remind them that they didn't have to feel sorry for me. I am finally out of my physical body. My soul is flying free. I'm dreaming that I'm, I'm gone. NYU Downstate is going to come pick up my body that was broken and find good use for it. It didn't serve me, but it will serve a purpose that weighed down, that weighed down, not working, never gave me a child, painful from head to toe body that no longer the shell of my soul's existence. I no longer had to carry its burdens, let alone the burdens everyone says I put on them with my illnesses. I am now here on this dandelion seeds, floating like a breath of fresh air until I make it to heaven, knowing I will feel at home once again with those loved ones and pets that have passed away before me. They've been waiting, they're preparing. I've heard them whisper in, on the ear, on, in my ear long before I die today, for they are ready for me. They don't feel sorry for me. I knew this day was coming, as I said. I came to terms with this long ago. I also stayed here as long as I could. I am now free, I feel so free. I don't think you understand how hard it is to live in a body that betrays you. I know there's a party being planned up here, up there in heaven because I've been dreaming about it. I'll be able to dance. I'll be able to hold my drink without fear of dropping it and breaking glass everywhere. I'll be able to eat without a care of choking. I won't need a week of recovery from being able to just go out for a few hours with friends. I believe I was a beautiful person and so was my life. I believe this even if people only saw me as loose, useless and needy. My life had a purpose, even if it was only found in death. Just as that child being healed by the life-saving medicine able to be created because of the cells studied from my shell. I believe the study of my body will help further medicine and why you downstate told me that it would. They are taking my body even though I'm overweight, which is something they never do because I have so many rare diseases. I did travel to heaven on this seed from a weed of a child wished upon, that a wish, a, a, a weed that a child wished upon, but it was my wish upon the same seed that will save lives 
and make a difference one day. So that day my dream came true. If you see a dandelion one day, please pick it up and make a wish. Someone's soul may be trying to get to heaven or simply remember me and smile. Oh my God. That was so heartbreaking. My God. Sorry. But this is what I'm writing. Wow. So. Glad you're writing. Mm. Thank you. I, I don't mean to make anyone sad, but this Such is what a I'm writing. Brave and beautiful reading. Yeah. Thank Very you. well done. Great. Very well Thank done. You. Thank you. Uh, it, I have to get out what I'm trying, what I'm feeling, you know, so thank you for listening. Beautiful and very brave. We appreciate very it being brave. here tonight. Thank you. Hmm. I am a happy person, I promise. Yeah. And you <laughs> look at I'm a happy person. <laughs> look at this was meant to be happy. This is a happy thing. Like it. Yeah, you just gave us a very thoughtful moments. Very thoughtful moments. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. Thank you, Annie, for sharing that. Thank you. It means a lot that you listen. So thank you. Well, I guess I have to try to introduce someone now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh no, we do have our um our featured writer and reader tonight, Terry McLeod. Okay. And um Terry McLeod, who also writes under the pen name as Joanna Whitmire, correct? <laughs> who is that? Uh who was born in towns. It's actually a name what now? towns. It's a name, it's you combine two little towns names together. They're right above Columbia. There's a little town named Joanna. And a little town named Whitmire. <laughs> that's where I got oh, it. I didn't know that. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. I did not know yeah, that. I thought it'd be a cool it's name. A, <laughs> it's a great name. Um, so Terry McLeod, also Joanna Whitmire, was born and raised in Colleton County. Did I say that right? In Colleton County. Colleton oh, County, yeah. South Carolina, where she still resides. In college, she minored in English and majored in biology and in fine arts. She worked as an educator for many years. She loves art, music, books, movies, soap operas, her family and friends, our beautiful earth and all animals, especially her own. I Found Me is her first published book. What kind of pets do you have? Uh, I have 14 rescued animals. I have a 14, almost 14. 14. Year old. <laughs> yes. My wow. dog is, my dog is, um, I guess he's a, what I call a lab mix. Somebody dumped him in my yard 14 years ago and he's been a wonderful dog. And then I keep collecting kittens and cats. I've, I've rescued six kittens from the dumpster in the past year and a half mm -hmm. and they're adorable. But I have built a cat complex <laughs> at my house. I actually, I have some in the main part of my house, three or four of them that are very sweet. And um, then I took, a, a, I had like two dens and I took this den, which is a step down from my kitchen through some French doors. And I made it into a big cat room. It's got sofas and chairs. I even have a TV in there for them. And then I put a cat door and they can go through that. And I put, um, I had a, a L-shaped screen porch. I glassed it in for them. And then I cut another cat door and I, I built a screened in um, outside area so they can sit outside. I've got chairs and shelves and they can watch my bird feeders and the, the grape arbors growing over it. So they just have a great life. But I have 13 rescued cats. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, is it called little cat? Oh, is it called little catios instead of patios? Yeah, I call, I call my outside area my catio. And okay. the four cats that can't get to the catio, I actually have what I call <laughs> a play pen. I um, took to have like a mesh. It's a, a, it looks like a pup tent, but it's mesh and it's got a floor in the walls. And then I hook a mesh tunnel to it and I bring it up to my French doors at, at my back door. So they can, the ones that are in the house can go out to the patio and sit and watch the bird feeders and the squirrels <laughs> and stuff. So, but like one cat came from a friend of mine who died from cancer. So I, of course I took her cat. She was older. Another cat, there was an older man who went to a nursing home and 
I took a cat, my sister took a cat, and my friends took both of his old dogs. So we've just kind of just keep, I, I just can't say no. I just feel like they need a home and I've got, a, I've got plenty of room. <laughs> it's very expensive though. <laughs> well, if I need a place to go, I know where to show up. Yes. I had a friend <laughs> one day, he asked me, he said, now Terry, just how far from your house does an animal have to be before you adopt it? And I said, don't you dare drop anything off in front of my house. <laughs> oh, man. Well, are you going to read from your new book tonight? I, I am. I'm very intimidated because everybody's been so good tonight. And I thought I would just kind of tell you about my book a little bit, and then I'll do a little reading from it. And there's a couple of bad words, and I'm just going to not going to say the words, but you'll know what they are. But um. <laughs> Just two bad words. But uh, this is about, and I, and I go cheat because I wrote like a little, little thing to read to you. I said, this is the story of the scandalous end of a long relationship and marriage that embraces the trite but true phrase that nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And I say this because to the outside world, it was a happy marriage of privilege, but behind those closed doors, it was a marriage marred by abuse, alcoholism and infidelity, along with the shame of enabling, covering up and hiding the truth. And all of this, the whole story, the divorce, everything is complicated by the intrusion of the husband's powerful family and their huge sense of entitlement, I should say almost comparable to the Murdochs. <laughs> they just think they are really all that. But um, kind of like Daphne du Maurier's book, Rebecca, you never hear the name of the narrator. And so I just say that this mirrors my divorce. And um, the reading I'm going to do is when your um, narrator is um, finally going to hire a private investigator that her lawyer has gotten for her to get evidence of her husband's 20 plus year affair with a very Ganky mistress. So this is that versus where I'm going to start. <laughs> so I said, most of my communication with the law office and Alan was through Emma. Alan was the lawyer, one of Alan's extremely competent and kind paralegals. She usually contacted me on my cell phone during the day when I was at work. At the time, I was working in a cute gift and garden shop and usually had plenty of free time and privacy. Finally, the call I had been anxiously awaiting came. Emma called and gave me the name and telephone number of the private investigator that Allen's firm used. Emma told me that the investigator was very good and very discreet. Then she reminded me that getting the goods on Jack and that woman might take a while, but to just stay calm. She said that once the investigator had gotten the evidence that we needed, we would finally be ready to make a move. Alan wanted all the proverbial ducks in a row before we served my, any papers on Jack and got the ball rolling. I felt relieved, frightened, charged up, and strangely sad. I made the call to the private investigator and he was very pleasant, very professional, and very reassuring. We discussed the mistress and when I thought, and when I thought Jack usually visited her. Then I gave him the mistress's address, telephone number, the kind of car she drove, and then a description of Jack, his office address, and a description of his car. Mr. Vance, the investigator, said that he, could, he, could, he would come to my shop the next day so that I could sign the contract and provide him with a photograph of Jack. After we hung up, I felt weak and jittery and consumed with guilt, sadness, and regret. It was really happening, and, that, and now that it was, I didn't know if I was ready. When I got home that day, Jack was not there. So was new. He also was not at his office. I knew not because I was stalking him, but because I had to drive by his office on my way home from work. I did the usual routine. I walked the dogs, fed the dogs and cats, straightened up the house and fixed supper. A very nice supper, by the way. I had long ago given up waiting to eat evening meals with Jack. He e either came home late, 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 and drunk, or if he came home at a reasonable time, he would usually sit on the porch and listen to a sports radio show that he liked while consuming vast quantities of scotch. He would eat if he ate after 10 o'clock at night, which was just too late for me. 
That night, after I'd fixed supper and had it warming on the stove, I plopped down to watch something on the television. Jack finally came home, very late, very drunk, and very irritable. To avoid any unpleasantness, I left his supper on the stove and went upstairs to read a book. I heard him coming to the house on the porch talking on his cell phone. A few minutes later, he shouted up the stairs, angrily saying something about not wanting to eat what I had cooked. Then everything was eerily quiet for a while. I lay there praying that he had passed out. No such luck. My heart jerked because I could hear him coming slowly up the stairs, muttering and stumbling. When he came to a stop at the foot of the bed, I steeled myself, looked up from my book, smiled and invited him to get in the bed and watch whatever he wanted on the television. He moved closer and leaned over the bed until his face was about six inches from mine and said in a sneering, contemptuous snarl, I refuse to spend the night with you in this house. I blinked in surprise and tried to reason with him. I knew better. You can never reason with a drunk and said, oh, don't be silly. If you really want to sleep alone, there are four other bedrooms and all the beds are made. He shouted in reply, I don't want to stay here with you. You stupid effing C word. I felt the air leave my body. I didn't know what in the world was going on, but I was frightened. A terrifying thought came to me and fear stabbed at my heart. All I could think was, oh my God, maybe he's leaving me before I can leave him. Then he said, I'm going to spend the night at my office, but I'm going to walk because I don't want to get a DUI. A light bulb lit up in my brain, a 100 watt flood light bulb. I knew where he was going. I knew that there were, that there were no comfortable chairs in his office and nowhere to sleep comfortably. I might be slow, but I'm not stupid. He was going to his mistress's apartment. He turned and staggered out of the room and lumbered down the stairs. I leaped into action. Oh my God, it was happening. I grabbed my cardigan sweater and pulled it on over my nightgown and ran to the head of the stairs. I could hear him in the den on the phone again. Then he staggered down the hall and slammed out the front door. I flew down the stairs and watched out the front door to see where he was headed. He walked down the drive and turned right onto the sidewalk outside the front gate. I grabbed my car keys and ran out the door, flew down the front steps and raced to my car. I cranked the car, backed it up, turned around and without turning on the lights, let the car coast down the drive until I was at the front gate. I peeked to the right where Jack was, just, excuse me. I peeked to the right to see where Jack was. He was standing at the end of our street at the stop sign and then he turned left. I crept the car out onto the street and up to the stop sign and looked left down the street. Jack was standing at the end of that street on the corner. Then he turned right and shambled along the sidewalk of the main road. Oh boy, he was traveling the long way, probably because it was well lit. Well, I knew the back way, the shortcut. There is nothing like being in your own hometown, your briar patch. I gunned the car across the main road when the light changed and made my way by back streets to the street that the mistress's low income apartment complex occupied. I pulled into the bushes across the street from the apartments as far into the bushes as I could and then cut the car and the lights off and waited. About 10 minutes later, Jack appeared out of the dark walking along the sidewalk. He stopped right behind my car. I stopped breathing praying that he wouldn't see my car or me sitting in my car deep in the bushes. Thank the Lord it was dark and he was drunk and completely oblivious to his surroundings. He lit a cigarette and then crossed the street to her ground floor apartment. He rapped on the apartment window with a secret knock he used to use at his brother Mark's house and then entered her apartment. I think that I might've been on the verge of hyperventilating. My heart was pounding so hard that it made my chest hurt and I could hear it pounding in my ears. I couldn't breathe. My hands were shaking so badly that I couldn't hold my phone. I had tried to take a picture of Jack entering the apartment, but my phone was wobbling and shaking so much that I was scared I might drop the phone out of the car window. I was in a full-fledged panic. Thank goodness no one's life depended on me that night. I was in pitiful shape. Desperately, I tried to think of whom I could call this late at night. Finally, I decided to try to call the private investigator. All of a sudden, I couldn't remember if I had grabbed my pocketbook when I grabbed my keys. But there it was. I reached in and snatched up my address book. I made myself take slow, deep breaths, trying to steady my nerves and calm myself enough so that I could punch in the investigator's number. Finally, I was steadying. It had probably been only a few minutes, but it felt like an eternity. 
Finally, I did it. The investigator's phone was ringing. I kept whispering, please answer, please answer. He did. I could hardly talk. I finally got the words out. Patiently, he calmed me down and told me that Jack was in his mistress's apartment. I told him that Jack was in his mistress's apartment and that I thought he was going to spend the night. Mr. Vance asked me what Jack was wearing. I told him, he's very handsome and has short light brown hair. He wears wire rims. He's wearing a white short sleeve button down shirt with khaki pants and he's wearing his loafers. He looks very nice, pathetic. Mr. Vance verified the address and the apartment number and said, okay, Mrs. M, you go home now and get some rest. We've got it from here. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, goodness, that man has a mouth. <laughs> oh, that, you don't know the half of it. It was worse. That's that was probably one of the worst. But it was like that all the time. He he had, had a big time. Oh. Play. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. And he was drunk <laughs> and abusive, but a fantastic dancer. <laughs> a fantastic what? Dancer. Oh That's my what God. I thought you said. Dancer. <laughs> Well, that makes up for the whole thing. Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> I love so how you dress. But he's so hand he's handsome and he dresses so nice. <laughs> you know, like he's a good dancer. <laughs> yeah, but he looks so good. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't that pathetic? <laughs> well, think about it. When when we it's choose so our love, movie, I mean, you know, yeah, we're usually you know, oh, I love like that. <laughs> well, in my book, I also <laughs> I also, a friend of mine, when I was writing it, he said, you know, Terry, you might need to explain why in the world somebody would stay with somebody like that. And I actually wrote 10 lame excuses <laughs> for staying with an abuse. I call him a, a triple A, an abusive, alcoholic, adulterer. <laughs> how, long did you, how long did you stay with him? We were together for 37. Oh, my God. Counting, counting the years that we dated. Does he know about this book? Yes. <laughs> oh. I'm sure. I'm sure his fam whole family does, but they haven't said a word. Are you in therapy now? Is that it? No, <laughs> I think the book was therapy. Yeah. It was therapy, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I changed all the names. Nobody's name was the same. I didn't Nobody. even say the name of the town. Yes. Uh, Nobody but everybody, I want you to know everybody in town knows. <laughs> What is the title again, Terry? It's called I Found Me because I felt like I had just gotten, I, I used to be kind of a cute, spunky person. And then all of a sudden I realized I just was lost in this marriage. It wasn't even me anymore. I was, you know, weak and always kowtowing and stuff. And, and when I finally got a divorce, I, I felt like it, it took a while, but I finally kind of found myself again I, I became my I'm still not quite as spunky but I, I found myself I, I kind of I was just so lost how long have you been divorced um let me think we were divorced in 2015 so that's six years six years how long did it take <laughs> to write the manuscript or the book is it published now um, it is published a picture of it and as my friend said why did you bother with a pseudonym when you put your picture on the front of the book i said nobody's gonna know that's me i'm four years old <laughs> that's really nice is it sad you who published it um austin mccauley and they published it it, it it was it should have come out before the pandemic or right around the time of the pandemic but they had that big shutdown in new york so it didn't, it was, everybody was put behind. So it came out um, in May of 20, of this past May of 2021. Anyway. Well, 37 years is a long time to walk on eggshells. Oh yeah. my God, 37 <laughs> years. But I will, I will say, and I have to say this, it, it was a very seductive lifestyle. Um, you know, beach house, mountain house, river house, hunting lodge, oh, yeah. big historical home, five acres of gardens. Um, cocktail parties, uh, big, huge family vacations. So you kind of put up with something because you're getting this great life, but it just wasn't worth it after a while. So Terry, have you, 
Did it come out as a creative nonfiction or as a novel? I just, I call it a novel. <laughs> and it's okay. very short, it's very slim. And I actually, a graphical novel. I, guess. I, I actually started at when um, the girl, girls, my hair salon, they, the girls that, that, the girl that cuts my hair, I kept saying, you know, yeah, because my lawyer kept saying, because he was from big city from Charleston. He kept saying, oh my God, the things that go on in a small town. He said, I hope that you will write a book about this one day. I hope you're keeping notes. And I was telling my hairdresser that, and she said, Miss Terry, you need to start writing. So I, I, for them, I wrote a couple of pages and next I went to get my hair done, I read it to them. And they were like, oh my God, oh, Miss Terry, we've got goosebumps, keep writing. So I kept writing and it got so they would call me and say, nobody's here, we're locking the door, so people are coming over, come read. <laughs> and then my little wine group started saying, we want you to come read on, we have wine every, we call the, uh, the ladies of the great, we drink wine every Monday. And they said, you got to start reading your book at our wine gathering. And I would read and, and that they really were the ones that pushed me because I would get to the end, they'd say, all right, you got to have some more next week. We got to hear some more next week. So I kept on with it. And then I said, um, I said, all right, y'all, I'm going to write the book. I'm going to go through all the formalities of getting it published. I don't even know how to do that. And, um, and then when I'm rejected, you know, we'll all, we'll, just, we'll all just forget about it. So, I mean, I had it handwritten in all these little journals. <laughs> and then I started typing it on my old laptop and it blew up. And um, I didn't have a printer, so I went to the library, <laughs> the Colleton County Library, and um, I checked out that book called The Writer's Market, and I start, I made this, I, I don't know how to do a spreadsheet, so I made a big chart that I could I tape to the wall, and I started writing down publishers that I could um, uh, apply to or submit to. And um, I, had to, I knew I had to look for um, small kind of independent publishers because um, I didn't have an agent and I'd never had anything published and I just didn't know what I was doing. But I would type at the library, I would print off at the library, then sometimes I would go to Palmetto Parcels and print and then I finally figured out I could go to Charleston to Kinko's and get things printed up and they would even gather it up like a book. Anyway, and I sent off about to about 10 publishers and I got some rejections. Some of them were very nice. One of them, I did the query letter, the synopsis, everything you're supposed to do. And I'm, I'm very anal about stuff. So I did everything you're supposed to do. And, um, but one of them, I'd only sent three chapters because the writer's market said you didn't have to send the whole book. And I got, when I got the rejection, I got a little personal letter on it. And he said, this is well written. I'm sorry, this isn't our genre. He said, my only wish is that you had sent the rest of the book because I am dying to see how it ends <laughs> but I finally got the you know the, the acceptance the contract in fact I had it for days and didn't open it because I pulled up I had my dog with me pulled up at my little my little mailbox and opened it and there was that big envelope and I, I looked at my dog I said oh Jasper it's another rejection so I threw it in the back of the car and we went to the house and then I took it out and threw it down on, on the sofa and after about a week, I looked at my dog and I said, all right, Jasper, let's open this and see and just read this rejection. And I opened it up and it was a contract. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know my whole history. <laughs> well, you know, I've, you I've started another book now, but it's not scandalous. This one's very scandalous. <laughs> you you talk about um how your friends say you should write why a woman would stay with the man for this long with all of this stuff going on. There's like a whole sub genre right. <laughs> to what is going on with you. And you should connect with those authors because then they're recommending your book and you're recommending their book. And that's, right. how, you, that's how you sell your book <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> But anyway, but I'm just honored to be here with y'all. I just, all these, y'all, all everything y'all read was just wonderful. I was just in awe of everybody. So thank you for letting me be part of your group tonight. Well, yours was so good. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Wonderful. Is, it, is, is the book on Amazon, Terry? It's on Amazon. It's actually at Macintosh Books in Beaufort too, but okay. it's on Amazon. Um, you can order from Barnes and Noble, Goodreads. Books a million, and my cousin found it at Target. <laughs> Whoa. 
<laughs> well, let me ask you something. Did, uh, did they end up on Amazon? Did they put it under um, romance? I don't know what they put it under. It seems what like it it well suited for that. And, and mm -hmm. romance flies off the shelf. Oh, well, right. well, so does scandal. That's for another category. <laughs> way, way, way. So it's, uh, take a look on Amazon and see I if will. It's, I've looked, I, mean, I usually just type the name at the top and look at it, you know. Right, but, in fact, I'm going to go look at it as soon as But it's in hardback, um, paperback, and Kindle. Yeah. Is that romance or anti-romance? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I know. I think it's just a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> Technically, <laughs> so I think that would No romance at all. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Not much, but great dancer and great big huge parties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we never we never ran out of scotch. <laughs> he would buy, oh, and along and along with the scotch, he smoked four packs of cigarettes a day. Ooh, a walking chimney! Wow, oh my God. he's still alive. <laughs> yes, he's never go die. He's just go mummify. He's pickled. <laughs> <laughs> Take all that tobacco. <laughs> oh, is he still God. handsome? Is he still handsome? Um, not as much. He's getting very dissipated looking. He still has he still has good bones, but um, he's getting he's kind of stooped over now, and he's he's very his face is very lined and wrinkled, and I feel I feel kind of bad sometimes because I know he's sitting home drinking all by himself. But um, anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think his family is so furious with me. Oh my God, they hate me so much. But I think they're furious because for 37 years, he was my problem. And now he's their problem. <laughs> and they are so angry about that. <laughs> are they angry about your book? I'm sure they are. I haven't heard from them. I think they feel like if they, if they just kind of stay under the radar with it that um, people will forget about it and, and it'll go away. They have not approached me about it at all. So we'll see what happens. Until it comes, becomes a movie. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I had, I had then a, you'll hear from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've told people if I, have a, if I have a reading, I may have to, in Walterboro, I may have to hire like a bodyguard that kind of just sit at the door to make sure that none of his family. If you make any money uh, on it, you'll hear from them. I know, probably. <laughs> That's the way that works. There was such great kinetic energy to that reading, Terry. You did that oh. so well. It really just comes through. And you, yeah, Where'd work go? Did voice, she leave? The, the way you add emotion wow. to it. I mean, I'm, I can I can only imagine what it was like to write it, but um, mm. thank God you did. Thank God you yeah. put yourself on the page and you wrote yourself. You, you wrote oh, a path you. to finding yourself. It was oh. really beautiful reading oh. tonight. I'm so glad thank you were able you. to thank do this with us. Well, I hope y'all will read it. And the last chapter, you get to hear I found myself and I even give you all good advice about what not to do that I did. <laughs> like always avoid the bad boys. <laughs> oh, Lord. Which I always say he was, he was a bad, the bad boy. Boys. Uh, the bad boys are... It was like he was covered with catnip for me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never married, but I, I can tell you about about a dozen bad boys. <laughs> oh, wow. They're always the fun ones. At least a dozen. At least a dozen. <laughs> they followed me around. <laughs> wow. <laughs> For years. <laughs> or I followed them, one or the other. <laughs> but they're fun. That's that's their problem. That's, that's they're the problem. Fun. They're a lot of fun. They're interesting, interesting yeah. fellows. Yeah, he was wild. I mean, he rode a motorcycle through his college camp, his college library. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's one of those. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, it's exhausting just it's thinking awesome. about it. Yes. It's exhausting. He was exhausting. To close out tonight. Yes. So Brooke has left us. Brooke ran out of time tonight. So I will oh. uh, be entrusted to say goodnight to everybody. This is actually our last Pat Conroy Center author event of the year. Uh, very nice one to go out on. I really appreciate all of you joining us on Zoom and everybody watching on Facebook tonight. 
and those who will discover it after the fact on Facebook and YouTube as well. It's, uh, it's always beautiful to spend time with you all. I'm glad to have some new voices in our open mic for the fun. first time. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank thank you. you. And Merry Christmas. Merry okay. Christmas, y'all. Oh, Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Wow. Happy Hanukkah. Yeah. Happy Hanukkah. Did you end up with, uh, your, with the girl? Huh? Oh. I want to know if Barry ended up with the girl. With no. The oh. no, I have no idea where I have no idea where she is these days. Okay, okay. <laughs> I read it once somewhere, and and somebody in the in the Zoom audience said she was my roommate in college. <laughs> oh my gosh! 